welcome everybody. I will give everyone a few minutes to trickle in as you are coming in, make yourself comfortable, grab your notepad, get your pen. This is guaranteed to be an amazing interview. You will leave with so many amazing nuggets. So we will get started. My name is Shay Calhoun and I will be your moderator for today. We want you to interact with each other in the chat. Let us know where you're Zooming from. Let us know what you guys wanna to learn today. This is guaranteed to be a good one. So let's set our intentions. What do I mean by that? Get your notepad. Let's think about what do I wanna take away from this? What can I apply to my daily life? All right, enough of that. The moment you all been waiting for, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce none other than the one and only Mr. Steve Harvey and Ms. Gailey Alex to Vault Empowers. Welcome. Hi. Good, good. Uh, thank you, Shay. Um, listen, before we get started here, I wanted to share with everybody exactly why I started uh, Vault Empowers. Uh, the main reason was to help other people get to the mountaintop. Uh, when I was young, my mother used to tell me all the time, she said, and I didn't get it back then, but she used to say, son, one day God going to give you a big house up on the hill. You can't get up there and don't show nobody else how to get there. That was a really important lesson from an, a very poor woman. And she saw something in her son that he didn't even see. So I thank God for that. Uh, what Vault Empowers is for me is... I'm not a very technical person. If you've seen me, you watch me, you follow my career, you'll, you'll know that I'm not a very tech savvy person or a very technical person. I don't, I don't know how to tell you how to get a PhD or a master's or a degree of any kind, because I don't have one. I don't know how to tell you, uh, you know, the equation for uh, physics or anything like that. Because when it comes to success, I have mastered one thing. And the reason I invented Vault was to share with you the one thing that I have taken control of and practice mastering. And it's something that you can too. And so instead of worrying about the technical aspects of your life, the number one thing that you have total control over is the mental aspect of your life. That is where I come into play. And that's what I love my focus being on because you've got to change your mindset in order to be successful. I don't care what you choose to be successful at. If you want to climb the corporate ladder, that's fine with me. If you want to do it through education, more power to, to you. I'm always impressed with people who can get educations, who can graduate from college and get higher learning degrees and all of that. It's, it's impressive to me because <laughs> I didn't have that skill set. But after you get all of this, in order to be successful, none of that's going to matter if you don't have a proper mindset. So what my whole thing has been through every motivational tape I've ever released has been to get a person to understand and focus on the mindset of success. Because success starts in here, the mind. I trust and believe it begins nowhere else. If you change your mind, you change your, 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 your altitude. If you change your attitude, you change your altitude. If you change your thoughts, you change your outcome. It all starts in the mind. So what Vault was created for was to teach you through people that I bring on to the show, the mental things of it. It's the mental side that'll get you successful. It doesn't matter what your degree is. I'm telling you, it doesn't matter. That degree eventually becomes a piece of paper hanging on the wall. What you do sitting in front of that piece of paper that you've earned the right to show to people that you have the ability to accomplish a task and complete it and get rewarded for it, which is amazing. I don't, please don't take nothing from it. But once you're sitting in front of that piece of paper, you got to perform. Because of all the people I've talked to that have ever graduated from school, the one course they don't teach in school is how to be successful. I didn't never ran up into the course on how to be rich. That's all I wanted. I just never saw that offered as a course. I wanted to be rich. Where's this course? And I found out it wasn't at the school, not the school I attended. It may have that now, of course, but it wasn't around when I attended. So we're talking about mindset. 
And we're talking about the things that you need to know mentally to, be, to get you where you want to be. And today I have someone who just exemplifies that. Um, you know, I was listening to her story and I started paying attention to it and I went, wow, man, this has got to be so great. So I, as I introduce her, even in the introduction, there's something to be gathered. And I hope you get it. I hope you're going to enjoy it because the person I'm going to introduce to you is considered the queen of do-it-yourself or DIY, which I didn't know what that was. I heard it on TV one day talking about DIY. I don't know what the hell it was. And I thought that's how you spell it. I just figured it was another word I couldn't pronounce. Dai. And uh, I didn't know what, what, what is DIY. And, uh, and through home improvement, uh, she actually shows millions of her followers how they can turn their house into a home through her inspiring and informative videos. And it's all about helping less fortunate and underserved and things like that. And uh, she didn't start out her career in home improvement though. This is the part of the intro that I want you to get. Because in fact, it was a heartbreaking split from her former fiance after she disclosed to him her eating disorder that led her to find solace in the skills that uh, 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 that she built while designing their dream home. Do you understand that? So who you are introducing you to uh, seemed to me, I don't know how she would describe it, but really came to life through a failure. And one of the valuable lessons I've learned is failure is a wonderful teacher. And it teaches you a lot about yourself. And this sister right here was really impressive to me. And I'm looking forward to diving into more of her story today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Gailey Alex. Gailey, welcome to Vault. I am, I am so honored to be here and, and speaking with you. So thank you so much for having me. And I cleared it with my HR person that this is perfectly fine to say you look absolutely gorgeous today. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That makes me that makes me feel better about wearing a hat. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, let's get into the let's start from the very beginning. In your intro, I said that you ended up you were building a dream home and designing your dream home using your skills with your fiance. And something happened when you announced to him this eating disorder. Kind of walk us through this a little bit. Yeah, I, uh, I, I appreciate you not being afraid to ask the difficult questions. Um, I, to clear the deck, I will say, you know, I, I take full ownership for, for why we ended. And it's because um, while I did open up about something I was struggling with and asking for help, um, the, you know, the, the weight of it was, was my fault because I'd been hiding it during our relationship when it really got severe. And I think that is, you know, a deeper dive in, into the issue with mental health, right, which is that mine stemmed from perfectionism. I always felt like I wasn't enough and I needed to be more and I was striving to be perfect, which is an impossible task. It's a losing game. And when I fell in love with somebody who in my eyes was absolutely perfect, I felt this immense proclivity to need to be perfect for him all the time. And that pressure started to make me sick and that that sickness you know presented as an eating disorder and I there was no way that opening up about that in our relationship um, would keep me looking perfect in his eyes right so I was I was telling myself it would be okay and I'll get through it and I don't need to ask for help because it's not attractive to not be okay and mm -hmm. as a result you know my secret made me sicker and right before, you know, we were getting close to getting married and, um, and I just finished decorating this huge home we bought in Connecticut. And I, you know, had spent so much time perfecting each room, making videos of it, surprising him with each room, really because I wanted to show him that I could do a good job and that I would be the perfect mm. partner. And in reality, I was just getting more sick because... I was trying harder and not addressing my insecurities and my pain. And so by the time I finally opened up about it, right before we were going to get married, it, it was a lie that I'd been carrying and I'd been dishonest. And so um, I, I was forced to, uh, to, to you know, go back to Florida and work on myself. And I checked myself into therapy. I found a, a therapist that specialized in what I was battling as well as a nutritionist. 
and I, I had logged out of my social media because I was in no emotional or mental state to be answering mm-hmm. questions about why all of his pictures were down or why the wedding didn't happen yeah. and yeah. why I wasn't in Connecticut anymore. And, um, and so the videos I had made of me decorating those rooms in that house for us and surprising him, those videos were still up, even though I was logged out of social media. And a few months later, when I felt like I'd been in therapy for a while, I felt strong enough and stable enough to face reality. I logged back in and I wasn't met with messages from friends saying, hey, you know, what happened? Are you okay?" And instead, it was thousands of strangers messaging me saying, hey, I just saw a video of you decorating this house or converting a garage into a gym. Is that something you could do for me? And I started to say yes to total strangers because I figured meeting new people and going to their house and creating for them what I was trying to create for my life and failed, but doing it for them would be a way to get out of the house and not stay home feeling sorry about myself, being in my sickness. And and it might might be a a cathartic way to to start to feel better. And what I didn't realize is that, you know, I was saving these homes, but in reality, these homes were saving me and these families trusting me um, and giving me their credit cards and everything I've done is a surprise. I never tell a homeowner what I'm going to do. They just leave for the weekend. I move in, they come home on Sunday and they have a new house. And it started out just me by myself doing this. And, you know, ultimately, you know, this is, this is actually what saved me was finding my passion out of my pain and giving my pain a purpose. And I think the most important takeaway from my experience is that, it's okay to not be okay. And Mm. if you feel like you're not okay, that's not something you need to DIY. Yes, you should DIY your house if you you feel Mm. the propensity, but don't try and DIY your mental health, ask for help. And if you get rejected, that's okay, ask for it again. If I had just given up and said I'm worthless and I'm not even worthy of help or wanting to get better, I wouldn't have checked into therapy and I wouldn't have stuck with it. Um, and instead I was brave enough to, to continue saying I need help and I'm not okay. And that fortitude is what got me to where I am now with just the amazing experiences I've had with these homes and getting to speak with you. Wow. You know what, uh, this, that's the fascinating part of your story because you mentioned you turn your pain into passion. I, I'm, I'm, I'm asking this question right here. Is this one of those things that you hear about? when people uh, suffer a loss or have a mishap or a misstep or a setback that kind of pushes them into their destiny? Is that kind of how you saw this happening? When I was in it, absolutely not. You know, I had, I had days where, you know, especially after the breakup and losing, you know, that house. And at the time I had left my job, I resigned from my finance career to get married. And I came home thinking I had no job. I lost my home. I lost the love of my life and I lost my health because I'm wow. finally admitting to myself, I'm not well. So when I say I was broken, I was, I was shattered and um, just like muscles, right? The reason you work out is because you tear the muscle down so that when it recovers, it, it, the fibers come back stronger and that's how you build muscle. And that's exactly what happened to me in my life. I had to get broken down so that I could build back stronger and, and really see what I'm made of. And what's crazy is that I used to sweat the small stuff. I don't even sweat the big stuff now because <laughs> once you've gone through that, right, it puts life into perspective and you're like, oh, my house is flooding. Not a big deal. I've been through much more. <laughs> right. like, this is great. Yeah. Like that's still a good day in my book. And so I, yeah. I think that there's, there's something beautiful about the pain. And to your point, um, I'm not special. This this, this, this is a story that has been reheated throughout history. You see mothers that have a child battling cancer and they leave their job and they become these amazing fundraisers for child cancer research. And, you know, people, people feel that if they can give their pain a purpose, it's not going to completely take the pain away, but it's going to soften the blow a little bit Mm. because there's a reason something happened. Yeah. But you know, uh, it, it is a special story. And it does make you special, and I'll tell you why. Because even though this is your pain, and you've given the description of somebody 
who has cancer, which you would consider a little bit worse prognosis or diagnosis than yours. But what happens is when a person such as yourself is able to open up and share with others what their pain was, these stories become inspirational because what it does is see everybody has these moments in their life. They may not be as big or they may be bigger or they may be very similar, but every living human being has these crossroads in their life. And when they hear stories like people from yourself who go through things like this, it causes them to go, wow, hey, I can too. If she did that, because it, it, through all of my hardships in life, I've heard some stories where I go, wow, okay, cool. I, well, I can do this. Like, you know, I'm trying to get in shape right now, right? And then I looked at this uh, Special Olympics uh, thing that they have for bodybuilders, and the guy came out and he has like no legs from the knee down and uh, a little abnormally in his hip, and he was ripped. And I went, okay, wait a minute, hold up, Steve. That that kills your excuse. <laughs> this this dude right here did it. And so I think I think you are special, and I think that you sharing your story like this, especially women, man, especially the heartbreak sometimes it takes women so far down, but there's always a up for you. And you got to see some women surviving at all. And I mean, like you said, you lost your house, you lost your health and you lost the love of your life. <laughs> wow. That's, 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 that's a big wipeout. And then for you to come. So congratulations to that. So let's get to this part right here. What is it? What, 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 what part of it? And where did you decide to start sharing these home improvement videos online? Yeah, great, great question. So, you know, to to piggyback off of what I said earlier, I I was posting these at the time to my 900, you know, friends and family followers. And um, I, I was doing it when I was engaged because more than anything, I, I wanted to to get validation so that my fiance would feel like I was doing a good job and see that everyone liked the rooms I was creating for us. And, and, um, and that's actually, you know, part of how I honed in on my editing skills, right, is practicing videos of my dogs and videos of that house. And at the time, it was it was out of my own insecurity to impress him, and not really any other reason. And then when, you know, when you look at what I'm doing now, and sharing it with four and a half million people between my two accounts, um, I'm, I'm sharing it now because I'm proud of it. Because I, I love the idea of showing people that, you know, if I can do it with no experience and no courses in editing, in marketing, in design, in construction, and I can figure out how to do that mm. and get millions of views, then trust me, you can too. Because two and a half years ago, I had zero experience with any of this. Um, so, so now it's more about, you know, showing people that, that if I can do it, I, I promise you can too. And then also there's a, there's an underpinning of mental health that I, I really want to normalize talking about it because part of why I got sicker was I didn't feel safe <clears throat> talking about it. I felt like I would look weak and I would, um, I would look broken and, and not perfect. And that's what made me, made me sicker. So like I said, your secrets make you sicker and something that I, I think is, proof in my social media and in my posts is that, you know, I took my deepest, darkest secret. We all have something. We all have something that we would be devastated if people knew about us or that's mm. terrifying and you don't ever, you will take it to your grave. You don't want anyone to know that was mine. I was struggling wow. so deep and it was so dark and it felt so imperfect. And I did not want anyone to know, including the person I was about to marry. So I kept this lie, right? And it made me sicker. And now the thing that I was terrified of anyone in the world to know, I have now made available to four and a half million <laughs> people, right? And it's, it took the yeah. power away from the secret. And, yeah. and instead it empowered me to be okay with the fact that I'm human. I'm flawed. I've had some really dark days. I still have some dark moments, but as far as, as far as where I am with, you know, mental health, I make it such a priority in my life and I make it so, so transparent on my social media and in my videos so that people, 
people know that it's okay to not be okay. And they also hopefully know that it's incredibly powerful and brave to ask for help. And if the person doesn't want to be there for you, that's okay. That's just not the person who's supposed to be there with you at that time. Ask again. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's, it's, uh, it's inspiring to me because you said you have these, some people have these dark secrets. Everybody has one that they have to take to their grave with them or so to speak. And I'm glad you said that because I have about seven of them and they're going to my grave and I won't be digging them up no time soon. And let's pray to God that they stay there. I got seven of them. Hey, let me say this, but with all that you do, the videos and everything, what's even more impressive to me is you do this while you're holding down a full-time job. Now with all this you're doing and you got a full-time job, how do you manage it all? This is probably one of the most common questions I get, aside from when are you leaving your day job? Um, but I think it comes down to this, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate here because my brain um, at rest, like my baseline calm state of, of mind is when I have multiple things happening at once. So if I'm laying on a beach in Tahiti, I am uncomfortable. I am anxious. My brain is spinning and I cannot sit still. For me, my, my state of calm is, is when I'm multitasking. And so that is hyper convenient if you're going to run multiple mm. businesses at once. So for example, when I am walking my dogs um, in the morning and late at night, I'm on the call with my uh, team who we're, we've got a, a decor line and we're trying to figure out how to efficiently get containers from our manufacturer over to the U.S. And when I'm folding clothes, I'm listening to an economic market update and taking notes on a notepad right next to my dryer. Um, if I'm on a design project, which I only do on the weekends because it's my side job, if I'm on a design project, I'm coordinating everybody. I'm designing and, and doing the decor. I'm also doing the construction and I'm also the videographer filming it, knowing that I'm going to edit it and create all these cool transitions afterwards. So like even on a project, I'm kind of wearing five hats just to get it all done. And that's how I'm the most productive. And it's also how I'm the mm. most calm. So for me, wow. it's, um, it's my happy place is multitasking. So it's, it's not that hard. <laughs> that's great. Okay. Let, let's, okay. Let's go here. We've got, a lot of people on this call, a lot of young aspiring entrepreneurs, a lot of people who are entrepreneurs. What advice do you have for that person who's trying to uh, build a purpose field and a profitable business from the ground up? What would you say to this person? I'd say there's a, a huge jump between an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur. And an entrepreneur is somebody that has all these dreams and they want to accomplish all these things but they don't want to do the work. An entrepreneur is somebody who says, like, I'm, I'm going in 100%. I'm, I'm going to put in the time. I'm going to put in the energy. I'm going to work the extra hours. Sometimes I get criticized on my social media for, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe sensationalizing, you know, burning out or working too hard or working late hours. And I, I, I get frustrated with that because um, my intention is to show people that when you're doing something that you're passionate about, it doesn't feel like you're overworked or you're tired. I wake up hours before my alarm clock goes off on these projects. I just want to get back there. I'm so excited. And so my best piece of advice, if you want to create a purposeful business is to first find your passion because inevitably your mm. purpose will be linked to your passion. And then the follow-up question I get is, well, what is, how do I find my passion? Right? Like I didn't find it till I was in my early thirties. Like if you're going to find your passion, it's going to be when you're doing something and time just starts to evaporate. Picture like your best first date, right? Imagine being on your best first date. You get there at 7 p.m., you sit down at the restaurant, and all of a sudden the lights are dimming and they say it's time to leave because it's 1130. And you cannot believe four and a half hours just passed because you were yeah. so enraptured in this person and what you were talking about, and all the butterflies you're feeling like that's because you're doing something that you're passionate about, right? You're falling in love. The same thing goes for business. Find something, a hobby. It could be playing with dogs, playing guitar, helping the homeless, whatever it is that time seems to just disappear. That's probably linked to your passion and that guaranteed is linked to your purpose. And I mm. promise you, your purpose on this earth is not to become rich. It is not to make money. If that is 
if that is your only purpose to be here, mm. you will not be successful. It's great to make money. And I guarantee you, if you find your passion and you go hard in the paint and really mm. push yourself to execute on however to make it profitable, the money will be there more than you ever mm. expected. But you have, to, you have to find your passion first. That's true. Okay, we have a, we're going to move to our moderator now. She has a series of questions, I believe. Shay? Yeah, listen, I hope you guys are taking notes because I am finding my passion and my pain. I think that is something that everybody can take away from. So if you guys have questions, we'll try to field as many of these questions we can in this hour interview that we have. So go ahead, where you see the Q&A uh, at the bottom of the screen, go ahead and put your questions there. But our first question comes from Emerstein tuning in from Augusta, Georgia. All right, the question is, what do you feel is the best way to launch a social media campaign on a shoestring budget? Hiring a social, a social media marketer can be expensive. I've been trying to do it myself, but with very little success. I'm not tech savvy and I just don't know where to start. I, I love that question. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever watched Shark Tank, but the problem that so many startup businesses have is they spend all of their money up front on marketing, right? They'll tell you, hey, we, we had a million in revenue year one, but we spent 3.5 million in marketing. So we're net negative a few million, right? And it, it's mm -hmm. always kind of the the anvil that sinks the, the ship. Um, and so what, what I think is really important when it comes to social media is that it can work for you or against you. It can work against you if you dump tons of money and resources into marketing um, because it's going to kill your margins, right? So if you can find a way to DIY, which Steve now knows what that means, do it yourself, <laughs> uh, then then what'll what'll happen is you just, you just, you know, crushed it with your margins because take, take what's probably 80% of your cost out of it. And now that's income mm -hmm. back in your pocket. But the problem is like, like to her point, she doesn't feel tech savvy and she wants to hire somebody, but it's expensive. Why not, why not invest in yourself? Right. It's kind of like that. You can bring a man a meal and he'll eat for one night, or you can teach him to fish and he'll eat for forever. Why don't mm -hmm. you just hire that social media person or a videographer for a couple hours to teach you how to edit, how to use Splice or mm. Final Cut Pro or iMovie, help them teach you. So you're investing in yourself, right? You're not investing in somebody else to do ads for you. You're investing in yourself to learn. And then you edit it yourself. You film it yourself. I built a following of four and a half million on an iPhone, right? Like all majority of the, the videos I filmed in the beginning, um, I edited just in the iMovie or the Splice app on my iPhone. I didn't even pay for software, much less editing courses. So, um, and my dad always says it takes a thousand hours of doing something to become an expert. So don't expect yourself to be creating these like, you know, incredible productions of reels for your first ads um, that you're posting on your media. Give it time, keep practicing. And then if, if it can educate somebody or entertain them or inspire them, right? So you teach them something or you make them laugh or you motivate them, if you can hit one of those three or all three of those in a 30 or 60 second reel, it's chances of going viral are much higher or on a TikTok. Mm. And then once they start to go viral, the followers come. So yeah. bet on yourself by investing in yourself instead of investing in somebody else to do it for you. See, what, what she says makes a lot of sense because I often get asked that question about people about you know, shoestring budget. I can't help you. I'm not on sho shoestring budget. By the time social media came out, I was, I was here. So, you know, I, didn't, I didn't never had to worry about a shoestring budget, but what I have learned about social media is like, she's talking about, okay, Gailey doesn't have the following that Rihanna has. Right. But what you, you got, you, you got to understand something, her followers, that four and a half million, it's really trying to figure it out how to do uh, do it yourself. They're really trying to figure out how to improve their home. Maybe looks for their house right here. You got to understand a lot of these celebrities, you're getting caught up on this Instagram with how many followers they got. A lot of them, a lot of them follows as kids, you know, there's just social media bandits. They just live on social media. Don't get hung up on that number. She has four and a half million followers. Even before that, you know how she got the four and a half million followers when she had a thousand followers. Mm -hmm. 
and she put up a video and like she said, it went viral. Viral means they take your video and they repost it. That don't mean you got to have the followers. They just repost it. And then eventually that led to some people following her. You can get it going without a ton of followers. Quit looking at what these celebrities have. Talking about, I don't have that. Rihanna made her money because she could sell her makeup to, to 117 million people. Okay, you don't have access to that. But do you have access to 10 people? You got to sell one tube of lipstick to later sell 10, to later sell 100. So you got to get a start. I think that's what she says, is a great point with that. And just getting started is is the, is the way to go. Okay, Shay? That's awesome. I think it lends itself to this next question for the both of you. What would be the best way to prepare and build your mindset? Gailey, we'll let you go first. Okay. Um, you know, when it, when it comes to your mindset, I think it, it first comes down to what are you watching yourself do to yourself when nobody's around, right? What are you doing behind closed doors? Are you making sure that you're getting enough sleep? If your body is telling you it's tired, are you making sure that, you know, you're, you're getting enough nutrients in your diet every day? Are you making sure that you're making space for things that help you recenter you and help you feel calm when you're anxious, right? Like whenever I feel my heart start to race and I know I'm having a lot of anxiety, I literally go into the yard and I play with my dogs and I just recenter and refocus and I put all my attention into them because it helps me get out of my headspace and, and brings me back to a calmer place. So, so I noticed that when I wasn't taking care of myself and I was in a really dark place, the stuff I was doing behind closed doors was not healthy right? I was staying up super late watching TV because my mind, like I couldn't calm down and I, I wasn't getting rest. I was not eating well. And I was actually eating very poorly because of my disease. And I was, I was, I was doing the little things, even just simply like knowing we're in a pandemic and not even caring to wash my hands when I got home, like, like that would make me feel like I'm not taking good care of myself. And that puts you in an unhealthy mental frame of mind. But instead, like I'm watching myself when nobody's around do things to set me up for success. I'm betting on myself. I'm wanting myself to win. I'm doing things to keep me healthy. I'm doing things to keep me sane. I'm doing things to help me calm down when I feel things are intense. And that is giving me the strength and the confidence when I wake up in the morning that like, I'm going to tackle whatever today throws at me because I'm prepared for it because I know, I know I'm taking care of me first. Wow. Yeah. I think, I think that's spot on with it too. Um, in addition to that, if you want to prepare your mind, I always start with a couple of other things too, a few things. First of all, dreams come true. Everything starts in the mind. It usually begins with a dream or, or begins with your imagination. Those are very important pieces. You know, you know, Albert Einstein had a quote that said, imagination is everything. It's the preview to life's coming attractions. Whatever you dream and imagine, that's important, man. That's where it starts. And after you have a dream and imagination, you got to start having a belief system. You got to understand and believe that these dreams are in your mind and this imagination is in your mind for a reason. It's put there. It's put there by your creator. You don't just wake up. <laughs> You're not just imagining nothing like it's hocus pocus, poof out the sky. No, man, your imagination, your creator places stuff in your imagination as a preview of a coming attraction he has for you. So once you start dreaming, you got to start believing in this stuff. And then the last thing I have for you is you have to feed your mind the right mindset. She, she hit it right on the head. You got to care about what you eat. You got to care about what you put in your body. You got to care, man. You, you can't be in shape and just eat cake. I can't. Now I got my son can do that because he's 24. You know, I used to eat cake all the time. I could, I stayed in great shape. I eat cake now. I look like cake. All I got to do is eat it and I look like cake. This is 65, fat boy. You fin you eat, keep eating cake, you gonna look like cake. So, you know, you got to feed your mind. I'm going to give you two books. I do this all the time, but I can't say it enough. The two books that's an absolute must 
for feeding your mind. They're old books. They're never going to go out of style. They are the beginning. Two books that's a must. Number one, The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. Everybody should read this book. The second book is The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz. That's the other book. Those two books changed my life. And I read both of those books in my 20s. And they did what they needed to do. It made me start understanding that there was power in thinking positive. There's power in that, man. That's all you need to know. And you can control your thoughts. And secondly, the magic of thinking big. That book right there, I, it just start, It just made me think. Because look, it takes no more brain cell energy to have a small thought than it does a big thought. See, Volkswagen, Rolls Royce, same amount of energy. I didn't have to grunt to say Rolls Royce. I could just say it. Now, you can say Volkswagen or you can say Rolls Royce. Choice is yours. But what happens is there's magic in thinking big. Those two books, The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale and uh, uh, magic, The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz, two must-reads to feed the mind to condition it. We dropped that in the chat. So for those of you that are trying to drop notes, I see in the chat you're asking, what were the books again? Um, we did drop that in the chat for you guys to see. Um, this is excellent. I know that Mr. Harvey has an amazing backstory of, of, of living in his car. And Gailey, you talked a lot about um, some of the hardships you faced in, in your relationship and loss of job. So we have a great question kind of centered around that. What are some tips for getting back into it after a setback? Gailey, over to you first. Yeah, so so if if every day you didn't feel great, you decided not to go to work, you'd probably not be successful at anything, right? <laughs> so everybody that's going to work every day and they're killing it, I guarantee you there's days that they get up and go to work and they don't feel good. They don't feel like they can kill it. They don't feel like they want to kill it. Um, but they know that this too shall pass and that they've been here before. Mm. They felt this way before. And today is no different. And if they just got out and do it, it's like a workout, right? Like, like, I don't always feel great before I'm going to go do a workout, but I know the reward at the end is going to make me feel mentally better, physically better. I'm going to move better. My energy is going to be up. My blood's going to be flowing. So even though I might be tired as heck, and, and maybe something bad happened the night before, or a guy like didn't text me back or whatever it is, I still get up and I'm like, I'm going to do it because I'm doing this for me. And I, I've never once regretted a workout, even though I really don't want to start 90% of them. So you just mm. have to, you have mm. to play the long game and you have to know that in the end, it's going to be worth it. And that all these other people around you hustling, trying to make their dreams, their reality. And they're saying Rolls Royce and not Volkswagen. They're working on days. They don't feel great. And I use that mm. as motivation. Yeah. That's so, you know what? She just said something that really hit home. The question is, how do you get back into it after a setback? You know what Gailey said? This too shall pass. I can't tell you Man, I wish I had understood that factually as a younger person. Oh, I got it down pat now. It don't even bother me anymore. I practiced it so many times. This too shall pass. You can't think of anything that you've ever gone through or currently going through that you haven't gotten through. Name it. <laughs> what? what? No matter how bad it seemed at that time, you've gotten through it or you're currently going through it right now. And guess what? This too shall pass. That's the truest statement, man. That's the mindset you got to have to understand. You're laying there wallowing in it. You know, when I was going through a really bad time, I was in so much tax trouble, man. I, I, everybody on my team had given up on me in 2008. They're going to come get him. They're going to take everything he owns. There's no way he can pay this much money. There's no way. That particular time, an old guy sent me something. He know nothing about nothing. He just sent it to me. He said, man, I saw you one day. You look a little broken down. I just wanted to send you something. He mailed it to my house. It was a plaque. The plaque said, if you're going through hell, 
keep going. That's all it said. There's an old man sent that to me. <laughs> if you're going through hell, keep going. And I sat there and looked at that plaque because if I'm going through hell, why would I stop there? That don't seem like a good place to park. I'm in hell. I'm going to stop here. No, man, the plaque said, if you're going through hell, keep going. Because guess what Gailey said? This too shall pass. And guess what? It passed. It, it did. And as daunting as I felt at that particular time, it gets that way. What people do when they get into a setback, they think it's permanent. What's permanent? What's permanent? You know, look, man, unless you get convicted, life with no parole. It, but even I can tell you, I know men who have been convicted with life with no parole and have turned their life into something productive. You know what they do? They take young inmates that come in there so that they don't make the same mistake they made and they work on them for when they get out. They created a purpose for their life. And I'm telling you, man, this too shall pass. I've had inmates tell me who, he said, listen, me going to prison was the best thing ever happened to me. And you're sitting there going, what? He said, man, if I'd have stayed out in them streets, I'd have been dead. At least I'm here, I'm living and I got life. Y'all, we, we're making some situations, Gailey's situation, I mean, look, you, you think about that. In one fell swoop, you lose your dream house, you lose your health, and the man of your dreams. Let's 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 go over that. Okay. Guess what she said? This too shall pass. That's an amazing thing. That's the mindset you need when you get into a setback. And how do you how do you get back into it? Uh, so, cause when you're going through hell, just keep going. That ain't the place to park now. It's not. It's hot down there. There are no <laughs> filling stations. They don't have bottled water in hell. You do not park it. Everybody, air conditioner out. It's just why we stop here. You know, you know. So that's gonna I, be a t-shirt. Don't park in hell. Don't, well, what? What you doing? That's you brilliant. know. Uh, so okay. <laughs> All right, I, and when I tell you the questions, the Q and A's are blowing up. I'm trying to get to as many as I can, you guys. So bear with me. We have a question that I think anybody that gets elevated to a level of recognition, celebrity status, you do end up getting some of the unfavorable messages. So the question is, what helps you be so kind when replying to mean messages, Gailey? How are you still so sweet and wonderful and kind when you get such mean messages? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love this question. Um, I've been very fortunate that I that they're few and far between, right? The, the outpouring of love and support has been, I'm, I'm beside myself, but there's definitely, you know, the, the hurtful or accusatory questions that come through. And uh, a couple of things happen, right? When I read that first is I take nothing personally. I take nothing personally because this person doesn't know me personally. So if you're being bullied by somebody who doesn't know you, then there is zero merit to put into what they're saying. And then that allows you to step back and take yourself out of the situation because it doesn't actually have anything to do with you or what you posted or what they're upset with you for. And instead you have to think this person is putting so much negative energy into attacking a stranger can you imagine how much they must be attacking themselves first to be in a spot that that's a good use of their energy, right? Like they are probably coming at themselves 10 times harder than they are coming at you. So showing them grace and kindness is a privilege because for whatever reason, they singled you out for energy, albeit negative, but they singled you out. So you're somebody to them, even though you don't know them. And, and they're exerting energy towards you. And if you have an opportunity to be kind back, why would you not? And something that, mm. that does bother me is when people, you know, see, see my responses and that I'm being kind when they're being mean and they're like, yeah, kill them with kindness. I, I, I get frustrated with that because I am in no, me, no way trying to kill them with anything because then that's actually like false uh, positive that I'm then putting back because I'm actually trying to take them down by being kind. And I don't, I don't believe in that. I think you should revive them with kindness. 
by showing them kindness when they're maybe not showing you that maybe helps them understand that, that, you know, they're, they're, they're still being met with kindness. And maybe that helps revive them into changing how they think, or maybe how they're attacking themselves that day. And I also think that people who have been through some really dark stuff are the people that have more depth and more empathy and more, more of the ability to feel when other people are hurting, because we all know hurt people hurt people and Mm -hmm. unhealed people take everything personally. Healed people take nothing personally, right? Mm. So if somebody's taking something personally, you know they are not healed and mm. you want to you want to have empathy for whatever they're going through because everybody's fighting something. So wow. that's 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 my thought process there. You know, man, I would uh wow. I just learned something from uh Kaylee right here because me, I want to slide in your DM and ask you to meet me face to face. That's how I want to handle it. And then we'll see how you are when we up on each other. That's, that's real. You know, I'm that other Christian. You know what I mean? The <laughs> one that's not really all, you know what I'm saying? You know, um, and so it's sort of funny, man. Uh, what she's saying is absolutely true. i tell you something that happened when uh, Marjorie and I uh, first got married. We were getting just beat up on the Internet, man. I mean, man, we were taking a beating every day. The Inquirer magazine was writing a lie about us. There's blogs was coming out with a lie. False stories was coming out about a lie. And we started to go back and file lawsuits. And we hired this lawyer named, I can't say his whole name, but his first name was Tony. And we were telling him how frustrated we are. And we sick all these lies and we sick of these bloggers and blah, 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 blah. And he looked at us and we got through talking. We talked for 30 minutes. We had presented all this stuff. And he looked at us and he says, let me ask you a question. Who, who would name some of your friends? And we named them, you know, friends we got. Some of our friends are famous couples, you know, Denzel, Pauletta, Tanya. Uh, Samuel, you know, magic cookie, you know, we know, we know some, cause we, we, we're in that age group, you know what I mean? So, you know, we weren't flexing. We just, he asked our friends and then he says, name some of your business people. And I named them and he said, let me ask you something, man. Do any of those people, you know, do any of those people blog? And I went, no, man, they don't blog. He said, have any of those people called you about any of the blogs? I went, no. He said, You know why? Because they don't. And he taught me a very important lesson. He said, people who blog are not decision makers. They're not shakers and movers. And they're not power brokers. Your life, Steve Harvey, is to be a decision maker, a shaker and mover, and you are a power broker. Those people who blog don't do any of that. So what power do they have in their life? Uh, He said, man, have you gotten a call from any of your business people to cancel any of your businesses because of one of these blogs? I went, no. He said, has anybody in the TV world said you can't come on TV anymore because we just read this? I said, no. He said, what? So you want you want me to sue who now? He said, it's going to cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars for me to go find all these people. He said, can I assure you they have nothing? And so what are we talking about? And I had to learn. And I, and see, I don't, see, she has a a, a site where she's helping people. You know, she answers questions on her blogs, you know, refers, gives them referrals and stuff like that. That's a, that's a great thing. I don't respond to anybody. I, I wish I could do like Beyonce. Beyonce post. And she ain't got no comment section. (laughs) Feel how you want to (laughs) feel. I'm Beyonce knows, partner. She just posts. Feel how you want to feel. And so, you know, listen, everybody out there, I was listening to Bishop T.D. Jakes one day, and he said, people don't talk about you for nothing. They talk about you because you winning. They don't talk about people that ain't winning. Look, when you get them comments, it's cause you winning. And Gailey said it best. Hurt people hurt. These people out here are hurting. So now they want to, that, that, that's not your business. 
And then one last thing, Joel Osteen taught me something. I always listen to a lot of spiritual cats because I need that, you know, to help calm down the dude that wants to slide in your DM and ask you to meet me face to face. I have to constantly pray for that dude right there because he he ain't rap right. You know, that's why I, that old Steve Harvey is still very much alive. You know how people say they got saved and they got washed white as snow. I didn't I didn't get that version. I didn't I got rinsed off. I didn't get the wash white as snow saved and born again. I just got rinsed off. And so the dirt that's still on me makes me want to, so I have to pray for this guy. Joel Osteen said, people's opinion of you is none of your business, nor should you make it yours. And I went, I'll be doggone. It's really not. What you think of me is none of my business. And Gailey said it best. They don't even know me. Most people don't even know, you know, you know, you're going to get some hurtful comments from some family and from friends that's going to come. But the rest, most people don't even know you. And and so, you know, th those are the things that I learned. And I agree with her 100 percent about the way handle it, the way Gailey said, do it, folks. That's the best way to do it. Don't take the Steve Harvey approach. Don't don't ask to meet face to face. Because Then I got bodyguards and it's not going to work out. That's when the, Go ahead, the HR and me will say, yes, please do not do that. <laughs> 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 Please do that though. But yeah, I hear you because sometimes you know you, you don't the old you still there. Um yeah. we have a good question. I'm gonna call this question, it's our last question. This hour goes so fast, but I want to respect um our guest time. Um, I'm gonna call this the mama I made it moment. So, what is the first thing you either did for yourself or bought for yourself in your new success? What's the first thing you did or bought? So, um, so if this is, this is truly a, a mama, I made it moment and I'm going to regress for a second. You just said that time went by so fast. It's crazy how fast it was. That's because we're doing something that we're passionate about. You see how yeah. that works, right? If Man. you're working things, like you're watching that clock tick because it's just going by, you're counting the minutes, <laughs> right? Yeah. You're doing what you love, right? Which I love meeting new people. I love talking about this stuff. I like trying to add value yeah. and sharing our pain. Like that is what we're passionate about. And it's why it, it goes so fast. So I digress. So, um, you know, my, my mama, I made it moment is actually not anything that I bought. You know, I've been fortunate enough in my finance career to, to have been, you know, able to, to buy things that, that I want, um, that were previously out of reach. So I, I kind of had already made it in a, a financial comfort level, um, before starting this. And also I, you know, I haven't charged for, for the majority of the first projects I did. Um, so it was purely passion that was driving this, but, but the moment that I knew that I, I made it, um, instead of buying something, I was at a, a, a friend's barbecue and it was me and a bunch of moms and dads and all of their little kids, you know, from three to 12 years old. And, um, and you know how, you know how when you're 12 years old, you're probably in middle school and there's probably that boy who, you know, is the most popular kid in school. He's so cute. He's so witty and you'll just, he'll never notice you. He doesn't even know your name. He walks by you every day, but you know everything about him, right? Cause he's the cool guy. Well, there was a 12 year old at this party, 100% textbook, the cool guy. I'm looking at him and I'm like, I'm in my thirties and I want this kid to like me. Like, I still have that <laughs> complex. Right. And, uh, and I was standing at the, the Island in the kitchen and he walks by and he looks up and he goes, Oh my God, I follow you. I know who you are. There's a celebrity here. And he started freaking out and he pulls it up. And he's like, look, I liked this video and this video on TikTok, And this, I commented on this one. And all of a sudden I was like, the cool 12 year old knows my name. I made it. <laughs> That's crazy. You know, uh, <laughs> it's true story. That, that was when I knew I made it. That's really cool. My story is going to be very different because when I made it, there was no social media. <laughs> so I didn't have that. My mama, I made it moment was really for my mama and my father. When I was 25 years old, I borrowed $5,000 from my father to buy a carpet cleaning machine to start help with my carpet cleaning business. He took out, he only had $5,000. He had a CD. He bet it on his son. 
my business crashed. I lost the carpet cleaning company, but I wasn't able to pay off the loan. So they took, my father had put up a $5,000 CD and that was all he had. And they took it. And man, let me tell you something. I, that was one of the most crushing moments of my life. As soon as I got my first check, my first big check from a TV show called Me and the Boys. I got a holding deal and I, I was homeless, so I got me an apartment that I needed a place to live first. But my mate, mama, I made it moment was, I flew to Cleveland on American Airlines. I gave my mom and daddy $25,000 cash. That was the 5,000 that I lost of his when I was 25 years old. I'm 38 now. I gave him $25,000 cash. And then I paid off their house. And paying off their house wasn't that big a deal. They only, they bought the house for $26,000. By the time I had made it, they owed 14. So paying off, it wasn't that big a deal. It was a huge moment for them. So it was about, about 40,000 total about. And I uh, paid their house off and gave him $25,000. And my mother sat there and cried. And she told my daddy to get on the plane and go back out to LA and see what that boy doing. Because he must be out there selling drugs cause ain't nobody <laughs> paying him this kind of money to tell no jokes. Slick, go out there and talk to your son so he can stop doing what he doing. But take this money and put it in the bank and pay that house off like that boy said. That was my... <laughs> And I kid you not, that's a true story. She wanted to make sure I wasn't out there dealing, but like, she also paid that house off and took that 25 and put it in the bank before I got arrested. That's what she thought. My mother did not understand the money I was making from television. It, it just didn't click with her. And a true story, my father flew, flew back to LA with me to see what I was doing. And that's when I first took him on the set of me and the boys and introduced him to everybody. And they couldn't believe it. Cause you know, I'd gotten a check before the show aired on TV. I told him I was going to be a TV star. He, mm -hmm, yeah. And so that was my mama. I made it moment. I've never really told that story before because of, uh, I don't know. I didn't, I, you know, I, I had a different type of past. So I never really, my mother never thought I was a criminal of any kind, but that kind of money, the only people who had that kind of money in our neighborhood was criminal. So that's what she thought of me. So that was my mama. I made it moment. Incredible. I love that story. <laughs> I, I was going to say all these years, I've never heard that story. See, you get the first exclusive here on Bought and Powers. Well, and Gailey I did that to me. You know, Gailey, I, I I'm that. telling you, Gailey, you've really been for me such a cool thing because you know, when I first heard about this and, and, and you losing your health in your house and your fiance, see, when you said it in that one sentence, that's major, man. And it, it's really good for women because so many women are tied. Women keep tying their success to a man. And even though you enveloped it and made it and bought it your own, still, you know, all in all, you know, you would think after you share something with somebody you love that they'd hang in there with you. You know, you you would think that, you know, I love you. We're going to take these vows forever, rich or poor, sickness and health. So you figure, hey, I'm going to marry this guy. Let me tell him about this sickness. Well, oh, no, I'm out. And that's kind of crazy, man. And so for a lot of women who are on here who have to come to the realize that oftentimes the breakup is the blessing. And I wrote a chapter in a book about that one time that the breakup is the blessing because sometimes you go, wow. And like what happened to Gailey was she jumped, but the jump came in the form of a kick. Sometimes you get kicked off the cliff <laughs> to make you jump, to make you realize all oh, this house you were building, you got a gift here. You're really good. And it's turned into a, a budding uh, thing that she does on weekends or crazy it's an amazing weekend gig <laughs> but you know i just think it's a fabulous story and you've been inspired me being here today and i really i just think you um been one of my favorites man because uh the the way you the way you explain yourself and what you've overcome and i think that's great for a lot of women to hear for anybody to hear because that that's a major loss at your house your health and the love of your life that's boom everything gone that's a big move that that crumbles most people. 
So thank you for can I, can, uh, I, can, I change, can I change my earlier answer about the mama I made it moment? It was when Steve yeah. Harvey said I was one of his favorites. Yeah. That's my mama I made it moment. <laughs> <laughs> for so sure. I'm calling my mama right now. <laughs> Look, yeah. I think this is so, I'm trying to respect every time, everybody's time, but I want to give you guys final thoughts and thank you. I mean, Gailey, you're, I, I piggyback on what Mr. Harvey is saying because your vulnerability and, you know, just being open and sharing your story is helping a lot of women, especially women that are out there kicking butt in a male dominated field, maybe, or starting a new passion or starting over. Um, kudos to you. So I want to make sure we give you time to give us any final thoughts that you have. Yeah, I, I, I will, I will first just say how grateful I am for, for you all, you all having me here and giving me the, the time and the energy and, um, and for everybody who joined on here, if you are watching this right now and you're here all the way till the end, it's for a reason. There was something on here that you were supposed to hear. There's something on here that maybe you were supposed to feel or realize and and the fact alone that you're on here trying to hear more about you know how to build a business or overcome something um, that is you investing in yourself right that's you putting time and energy into educating or motivating you're putting yourself in the exact situation to win just by being here so I, I love that I appreciate that and I'm, I'm excited that that there's so many people that are investing in themselves in that way. And, um, and the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll close by saying is that if you don't bet on yourself, why should anybody else? Mm. You have to bet on yourself <laughs> in order for anyone else to want to. Can you imagine going into a job interview and you're like, I really want them to hire me. I really want to be good at this job, but I don't think I'm going to be that great. And I don't think that I deserve to be hired, but I'm going to put myself out there. Anyway. You're bringing that energy into the room. You have to say, I know who I am. Even if I don't have the same training or the years of experience or whatever, I know that I will out hustle, out work, out study. Wow. And, and I know that I deserve this job. And I'm going to show them when they hire me, I'm going to remind them why they took a chance on me versus I really hope they hire me. If they don't hire you and you know <laughs> that you would kill it, that's their loss. Thank you. Next. Yeah. Wow. That's powerful. That's you know, good. for for me in closing, I would say to people, listen, all of your flaws, all of your past, those are valuable pieces. Those pieces got you and made you who you are today. Every last one of those flaws, you know, as I listen, you know, when I listen to people and then I give my side, my side is always a little uh, kind of like a Steve, you sure you should have said that? Well, I got no other way to say it to you because everything that I used to be, every flaw that I had, everything, stuff that people told me would never work with. You got to stop doing that. God has taken all of my past and all my flow, flaws and boxed them up and packaged them and allowed me to use them for the good. As long as I'm trying to do good, he can take all your past flaws and, and the things that people have criticized you for, use them for the good. Steve, if you don't learn how to speak proper grammar, you'll never make it on TV. Well, ain't nobody on TV like me. So now, pe people tune in because ain't nobody like me. And I'm going to say that ain't nobody like me. Now, if that's not how you talk, that's cool. But that helps make me me. Family feud is back because I'm the I'm the way I am. I'm not fitting to change that for nobody because the God I serve takes my flaws and my past and who I am and allows me to use it today for the good. God know I don't take a whole lot of mess off people. He know that. God know I'm not finna turn the other cheek. So don't come over here smacking me. I'm not that Christian. I'm not that dude. So now, now that we got that out the way, let, let's deal from there. And th that toughness in me has allowed me to, to, to withstand my setbacks and, and, and my critics and all my enemies. And, 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 and I've learned that all of my past and all of my flaws, they are fine. So y'all quit trying to, quit trying to be perfect. Cause Kaylee said, you're not, there ain't no perfect. You're not finna be perfect. Stop. 
Stop trying. The Bible says there's none perfect. No, not one. Not a single one. So I gave up on perfection a long time ago. Let me take the way I am and let God use it to his glory and to his will and see what we see what we come up with. So that's important for people to know. Stop trying to be perfect. You're not. Don't worry about your flaws. God can use that. You tough. God like tough people. He do. He really do. But God likes kind people too. God likes loving people. Like they tell Kaylee all the time, you, you're killing them with kindness. No, I'm not trying to kill anybody. I'm really trying to breathe life into people. That's a great person because I ain't that way. I try, I'm trying to kill you. <laughs> I'm really trying to try to kill you. This, this, somebody got to die. So you know, what? You over here with me? Don't come over here. <laughs> you come to me. I got something for you. That's what make the world go round, man. But then I ask God for forgiveness. He teach me a better way to do it. Okay, Steve, you can't be out here killing people. You work for me now. And he finds another way to do it. So, you know, uh, success is the sweetest revenge I've ever had. I don't have to flex on nobody. I don't have to say nothing to nobody. All my haters, all you have to do is turn your television on any day of the week. The little boy that you said wasn't going to never going to make it. The one that you thought since they canceled all his shows and had wrote him off. That little boy right there, the one you said had a stuttering problem. Ain't nobody going to listen to you. You know, the women that told me you ain't going to ever amount to nothing. My former mother-in-law, you know, all those people. They just turn your TV on. And there he is. Ta-da. Thank you. Ta -da. Look at that. Okay. Period. That's what the young oh. hair period. Um, this has been really great. I wish that we could take all of your questions. Unfortunately, we have come a little bit past the hour. Our next session will be with Jamal King on Wednesday, March the 9th at 6 p.m. Eastern time. You don't want to miss that. Again, thank you so much, Gailey and Mr. Harvey. This has been inspiring for me and I hope that everybody else feels the way I do. We appreciate your time and your wonderful insight. Gailey, we wish you all the best. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Hey, Gailey, Gailey thanks a lot. Stay fly. Keep it pimping. I got to go tell my mom. You said I was one of your favorites, so I got to go. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Shay. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.